Please help me welcome our speaker for the morning. Dr. Casey Law is a research scientist at Caltech's Cahill Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics and at Owens Valley Radio Observatory, Avro. He holds a bachelor's degree in physics with distinction from the University of Hawaii in Manoa, if I got that right. He holds a master's in astronomy from Boston University, and he received his PhD in astrophysics from Northwestern University in 2006. Presently, he is leading the Software and Algorithms Lab of Avro, where he is managing the development of data analysis software for two of Avro's radio interferometers, the Long Wavelength Array and the Deep Synoptic Array, DSA. And, well, he's got a great many other things as well, including the Real Fast Project, which involves the Very Large Array in Magdalena, New Mexico, which, as I understand, is one of the ways that you are looking for fast radio bursts. And we'll probably hear something about before we're done this morning. With that, Dr. Casey Law, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We'll open for questions at the end of the presentation, when we'll also pick up any questions typed into the chat. For that reason, right now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. With that, Dr. Law, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I guess I should be also honored to be the last talk of the series, at least until this suspended period over the summer. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do my best to, uh, to meet the standard of this great uh, series you've had going. So let me begin by getting my screen sharing back up. And okay, we tested this once, but can you confirm just again, this looks good. You see the title slide? Yes. Yeah. Thank yes. you. All right, so um, right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so I've, um, this is a talk uh, which has a lot of deep connections to radio astronomy, but also I'm gonna try to make some connections to to uh, Palomar and, and other optical facilities. Um, but uh, fundamentally, the story is a, uh, about uh, the discovery of something we didn't even know existed about 15 years ago. And that's what this fast radio burst phenomenon is. So uh, the story is still unfolding. And in fact, we don't know all the answers, but that's part of why uh, we're so excited about uh, all the things we're doing at OVRO and at the VLA in New Mexico uh, to, to probe this new phenomenon and just learn everything we can about it. So the phenomenon we're talking about is the fast radio burst. And, um, and let me tell you a bit about um, a somewhat bigger picture of talking about the you know sort of the the um, the field in which uh, this topic uh, exists, which is kind of more generally called astrophysical transients. So transient refers to things in the universe that are bursting, flashing, flickering, you know, burping, uh, whatever word you might like for that. Um, and we're talking about things that are are, are changing in time, but particularly things that change, um, uh, turn on and off. Um, uh, uh, you know, often you think about it as a cataclysmic thing where it might be a, an exploding star um, or it could be a star falling into a supermassive black hole that gets shredded apart and then uh, that, that produces lots of light, you know, x-rays and radio waves and other light. Um, or it could also be things like uh, rotating compact objects like a neutron star that has a hot spot on it and it flashes as it points uh, in your direction. So all of these things we consider just generally uh, transients, and I'll use that term a lot in this talk. Um, so uh, we study transients uh, in a variety of ways. And so I know given it's the, the Greenway uh, talk series, uh, we, you know, a lot of people, uh, imagine a lot of you have um, experience with optical telescopes. So I just wanted to make that bridge the radio domain through this graphic here, which is kind of handy. Uh, where it shows the uh, what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So um, 
all of the uh, these terms we use uh, in this diagram, whether it be uh, you know light as we call it, so visible light, infrared light, uh, microwaves, radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, these are all references to different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. So we call them light uh, or radio waves uh, interchangeably. And uh, you know, for for a sense of scale, radio waves are about as uh, the wavelength of that light is about as long as um, you know the, an antenna you might see for communication purposes. So uh, you know, an FM radio antenna is a great big uh, mast. Um, you know, an AM an AM antenna is a great big mast. FM antennas might be somewhat more compact because it's a shorter wavelength of of light. And then you know, microwaves might be something that can fit in your cell phone, right? That's the size of the antenna that's sensitive to that wavelength of light. And that's sort of the domain is sort of in that between FM and really closer to the cell phones and Wi-Fi communicate with the bands they communicate at is where we uh, you have really um, easy access to the radio sky and also the ability to make very sensitive radio instrumentation. So that's where we tend to work um, in the study of uh, fast radio bursts in particular. Uh, and in, at OVRO, we actually um, have facilities that, that span a lot of this uh, elect this range of uh, wavelengths of the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. So at the low end, we have a telescope that's called the, uh, the Long Wavelength Array, OVRO LWA, which is uh, this sort of um, has a sort of pyramid shaped antenna, which is very, very simple and cheap. And it has it's about if you stand next to it, it sort of comes up to your chest. So that gives you a sense of the wavelength of light also that it's sensitive to. And that goes, um, you can see also the DSA here on the bottom left. So that's an antenna with a receiver, which is a little more compact. It's sensitive to, uh, you know, uh, 20 centimeter wavelengths of light. And then on the bottom right, there are also um, this development of instrumentation at, uh, um, at OVRO related to uh, millimeter astronomy. And that's been part of uh, the project called the COMAP instrument and the Event Horizon Telescope, which is now famous for taking the first image of a uh, the shadow of a black hole, as you might have seen in the news. So that's that's the sort of wavelength um, space. And when we talk about transients more generally in the and radio transients, um, we also talk about it in another axis, which is sort of the time scale. So you know transients can be fast or slow. Um, and the fast or slow in this sense, um, you can think of the time scales from something of the order of uh, uh, you know, like a bursting uh, supermassive black hole will change in time, the brightness will change over years and years. So you'll see flickering, bursting, sort of slow rolling, you know, uh, plasma jets are blowing out from the supermassive black hole and time scales of years. And you can go all the way down to the fastest stuff, which is like associated with very small, intense, intensely bright um, uh, emission from uh, neutron stars. So maybe a little plasma instability is that it produces pretty luminous blasts of radio waves uh, in just a nanosecond or a few nanoseconds. And that's what's on the left side of this, this graphic. So that's uh, a wide range of timescales. And obviously, uh, when you're developing instruments, you need to think carefully about what part of this sort of space that you see here you want to study. If you want to study fast things, there are certain, um, certain aspects of the um, uh, instrument design, you have to think carefully about you're studying slow things, you have to design it customized for that purpose. Um, and then uh, one other aspect of this is there's this diagonal line between what we call coherent and incoherent emission. And that's sort of a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, maybe a jargony thing and it comes out of physics, but the idea is that you have these electromagnetic waves um, and you can actually have um, uh, Things like um, the supermassive black hole uh, jets and so on, which are basically big, stirring up lots of material and uh, making it very hot or, or, or energized. And then that plasma is in it, might emit, um, uh, emit uh, uh, sort of in, uh, independently. All parts of that plasma will be emitting radiation toward you. But then you can have things that are like coherent emission, which are stimulated, and they might be more like a single electromagnetic wave produced by a giant. Uh, a volume of plasma. And that's more akin to what produces these fast transients that we're excited about studying uh, uh, for the fast radio burst phenomenon. So pulsars are another coherent phenomenon that comes from neutron stars, as well as some stellar processes like stellar flares from, uh, from uh, plasma physics effects. 
So that's kind of giving you a sense of where uh, where things lie in sort of time and wavelength and um, and coherent processes for transient physics. So let's um, dive in a little bit on what uh, what a fast radio burst looks like. You know, what are we talking about when we say we 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 we, we detected a fast radio burst? So the time scales we're talking about are generally about a millisecond, um, and it's a millisecond flash uh, radio light. But what we've learned is that these are actually, um, as I'll talk about, they're they're actually um, have this. Um, they're actually originating. They're coming from uh, very, very distant, great distances. So other galaxies, even other galaxies that are you know halfway across to the edge of the universe, right? And so um, uh, some of those um, uh, signals can repeat sometimes. So you might have a burst, and then there's another burst, you know, uh, a year later, or it could be a bunch of bursts uh, even on the same day while you're staring at this thing with the telescope. Um, and so there's different kinds of uh, repeating and non-repeating FRBs that we've identified. And when you just um, consider how we've surveyed for them, how often we look and how big of the area of the sky we looked at, we've looked at, you can estimate how many are occurring across the entire sky every second. And it's roughly once per second across the entire sky uh, down at the sensitivity, sensitivity limit of a typical telescope. So that's a very high rate of occurrence which is a fun part of the story is that these are actually not necessarily rare. It's just that our telescopes tend to look in very small areas of the sky. And so we didn't appreciate um, that they existed until recently. So how do we go about finding these things? So um, this is a little time-lapse movie of a dish of the very large array in New Mexico. And uh, if you haven't been there, I encourage you to visit if you're ever in central New Mexico, it's about an hour's drive uh, west of the freeway near Socorro, New Mexico, uh, or an hour's drive west of Socorro. And um, so we've actually um, developed custom digital instrumentation that we've uh, uh, attached to essentially the back end of this telescope, not the back end physically, but the back end in the sense that there is a, um, there's, a there's a large room where all the, di the instruments are, send their digital signals, and we're able to do what's called um, correlation where we combine those signals to make essentially images of the sky. And then our instrument is, is attached to that imaging system as a secondary pipeline to, to search what we call commensally. So in parallel with normal observations, we can then take a copy of that data and search a very fast copy of that time stream to look in images for very brief flashes of red light. And that's what we call a fast radio burst. So um, so that's the that's sort of the, the very very quick overview of how you know how uh, radio telescopes are um, uh, impl you know implementing these searches and there's a lot to go into in that area I could certainly um, dive into that more and I'll talk a bit more about the the deep synoptic array in a moment too. Um, but one of the principal challenges of uh, searching for transients with these radio telescopes is that they are very um, again our field of view is very small. And they're very elusive. And so you'd like to make sure you measure everything you can when you have that transient show up. So uh, this is where I have a, a, <laughs> a bit of a joke here. So uh, pop quiz, uh, if you can tell me what do transients have in common with uh, Alexander Hamilton and COVID vaccine and the rapper Eminem? You can always drop your ideas in the chat. <laughs> Um, give you a chance to, to reflect on that. Okay, um, and so the answer is you get one shot. So transients are these brief flashes, right? In many cases, that's a single flash of, of radio light that that will be that will you know that will come and be to uh, you know hit the telescope uh, reflector and be you know potentially detected by your 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 algorithms to find these brief radio flashes. And if you don't find that in the brief moment of time that your computer can process the data, then you've actually lost an opportunity to, to identify and, and, um, and understand what happened. And so that's, that's really a big part of how we design our instrumentation is to try to uh, not only detect the instrument and detect the signal, that the transient signal, but also to um, capture as much information as we can in that brief uh, millisecond uh, radio flash of light. Um, so that we can actually understand what happened. For example, where did it come from? Um, you know, uh, 
Is it polarized? You know, how, how wide is it uh, in time? Uh, you know, all those sorts of things we want to study. Uh, but we only have one shot at getting all that information with our digital instrumentation. So um, a bit of background um, in how, how RBs were first uh, identified. So prior to that, you know, I mentioned 15 years ago, we didn't know these things really existed, right? So prior to that, the field was really dominated by uh, the field of radio astronomy and radio transients really dominated by the, the goal of understanding pulsars, which are in themselves an incredible instrument for uh, understanding strong gravity, things like um, you know, Einstein's uh, general relativity, uh, uh, but also understanding the nature of how stars uh, die and what happens to them after they die. And the way the basic signal uh, that the radio signal that pulsars emit is essentially a, a beam of light that comes out of the poles of the uh, of the along the axis, the magnetic axis of the neutron star. And one of the funny things about these neutron stars is that they have a magnetic axis that is not necessarily the same as the rotation axis, as is shown in this diagram on the left. And so if you have this light being emitted along these, this magnetic axis shown in yellow in this diagram, but it's rotating about the red axis, what you have is what's called a lighthouse effect, where the the light will uh, rotate and make a sort of a cone and, and sort of if you're aligned, if you're sitting at looking down at the pulsar along one of that, those axes of the uh, yellow uh, uh, cone, you'll see a brief flash of light every time it points at you. So flash, 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 flash. And that's a kind of transient that repeats uh, and it tells you directly about the rotation of the neutron star, which is really um, uh, an incredible uh, way to study uh, the physics of neutron stars, how they how they evolve as they spin, you know where they came from, and more. So here's an example of the the uh, Murrieng Telescope, formerly known as the Parkes Telescope in Australia, which is a, a venerable instrument that's done incredible things uh, in in pulsar studies and FRB studies, uh, par partly because it has a very um, a uh, nice receiver on it for doing uh, large surveys of the sky. So the Parkes telescope uh, was the one that made the, the first uh, discovery of a fast radio burst. So uh, this is a what's called a dynamic spectrum of the radio light um, measured by the Parkes telescope, uh, by, sorry, by the, the Murray Yang telescope. Um, uh, uh, and uh, what the uh, what people did for the with this, um, so let's see, I gotta back up one second. So Pulsars, right? So we had these large pulsar surveys. They were um, studied in a way just to identify the pulsars, right? So they were looking for signals that were consistent with what we expected from pulsars. So repeating things, uh, also things that were consistent with being located in our own galaxy. And what they did was actually at one point they decided, well, let's take a look. What would happen if, uh, if actually there was something that was located, a, a transient that was outside of our galaxy and was traveling toward us through intergalactic space and uh, you know other galaxies along the line of sight and then into our galaxy what would that signal look like and what they would what they realized is that you would have an extra sort of delay in the way the signal arrived at the telescope uh, that was maybe not in, uh, considered in the search algorithms and so they ran the reran the search algorithms with a uh, searching for signals that were progressively more and more uh, delayed as you see uh, in this plot until they found one of these extremely bright uh, radio transients with this very steep slope that dr drifts out right off to the right at low frequencies. And that dispersive delay, uh, is what we, well, that delay is what we call dispersion. So it's a uh, frequency dependent arrival time where it arrives first at the top and later at the bottom. And the, the amount of delay there is consistent with having uh, basically uh, lots and lots of material between us and that um, the source of that emission. Uh, and whereas uh, if it was just coming from within our own Milky Way, you might see a delay that's you know, consistent with maybe 100 or so milliseconds. This one was delayed by about 400 milliseconds across this band. And that was a real uh, surprise. You know, they didn't really know what they were, they were gonna find when they started the searching in this, for these kinds of signals. And when they found one, it was instantly uh, clear that something really, really different was happening here. Because once you have this much dispersion delay, and you know the galaxy can't produce, our own galaxy can't produce that much dispersion. It instantly means that it must be very far away because intergalactic space has very little material. And so to add up 
all that material means that it has to go not just a little bit far outside of our galaxy, but very, very far, you know, megaparsecs or even gigaparsecs away. Um, but there was a, a wrinkle in the story, which was that at the same telescope, they were also identifying a very frustrating, confusing signal, which was a, which was named periton, uh, which is a, a Latin word that was invented by an astronomer, to, uh, or I guess wasn't invented, but it was a Latin word adopted from a story about a like a two-faced uh, creature, I think. <laughs> and the idea was this astronomer chose this name because they realized that, you know, this signal that they were finding um, was at least in terms of uh, this little slice of the data looked very similar to these fast radio bursts. When you looked at um, other information that was measured at the time, you could tell actually it was um, actually interference, uh, likely some source of interference that's local to the telescope. And so uh, there was this long conundrum, uh, sort of a dark period in the study of fast radio bursts where it wasn't clear that we were seeing something really truly astrophysical and grand and exciting, or someone you know microwaving their burrito for lunch at the visitor center. Uh, so it, happily, that story was resolved when uh, people were able to um, uh, build better instrumentation. We found more FRBs at other telescopes and we knew that it wasn't just a, some sort of peculiar uh, phenomenon associated with one um, kind of interference at the, at the Mary Yang telescope. Uh, so I can tell more about that story also if people are interested in, in the Q&A. Um, so uh, I didn't really go into detail on this. Let me explain this, um, this uh, dispersion effect a little better. So what um, I talked about the frequency dependent arrival time in this, and it's shown in this dynamic spectrum, where the high frequency radio waves at the top and the low frequency radio waves at the bottom, and the signal arrives first uh, at the top, and then you see it progressively delayed and a little late at the bottom. Um, so that's, a, that's an effect of, uh, as I mentioned, it's an effect of uh, radio wave propagation through ionized gas. And so the more that sweep stretches out to the to late times on the right, on the bottom right, the more material is, there is between you and the source of that light, because the assumption is that initially it was a nice vertical line. So um, uh, you can actually, um, you know, so in, in, in many um, sort of like ham radio contexts, people sometimes call this a chirp signal, so it has a has a sound that sort of sounds like a chirp if you play it. And I've actually made a sound uh, for this uh, little signal you see here, and I'm gonna play it for you. So let me try that. Yeah, hope that, okay. hope that came through okay. Um, so that's, that's the uh, direct um, sonification of this radio signal that you see in this graphic here. And that's why it's called a chirp. So the choo, so the, the longer it stretches out to go to the low frequencies at later time. So if it was to go choo, like that, that would be a very long dispersive delay in the sound effect. And if it was more like a choo, like a very fast sound, it would probably not be very large disper largely dispersed. Um, and so that tells you again about the material that's between us and the source of that burst. So our galaxy in this plot is, uh, in this image is on the bottom right, nice spiral galaxy like our own home, uh, the Milky Way. And this radio burst is coming from some distant galaxy, which has lots of material around it. And then the space between us also has lots of material. So it might sound a bit like a nuisance, but I mean, in fact, that material is, is something that we can study with this dispersion delay, as well as other uh, effects of the propagation. Um, so there is a, the, when you measure the total of all that dispersion, you can think about it as a contribution from uh, material that's close to the FRB source, so um, the engine of the FRB, if you like. Uh, the host galaxy has some of that material, the intercluster medium, circumgalactic medium, intergalactic, and then our own interstellar medium. And so by we actually study, and in, in other ways, we can study our own interstellar medium and actually uh, model that pretty well, and we can take it out. And that means that we can essentially subtract that term and then study the sum of all these other terms uh, that are outside of our galaxy. And that's incredibly powerful because um, other means we have of studying that medium are very indirect and, and, uh, and doesn't tell us exactly about the density of gas. 
here we have uh, an, an integrated measurement of the density of gas in all of the, this, these different components. Um, and uh, that has potentially some of the biggest um, uh, implications for the study of FRBs is really through their use as a cosmic ruler. And this is something that is a, a long-term you know, uh, growth area for the field. You know, my talk today is mostly about, you know, what makes them, you know, the understanding this mystery of the FRB. But um, uh, once we've sort of understood roughly how they behave, you know, we know that they just have these brief radio flashes that are good probes of the medium of you know, the gas outside of our galaxy. We can then think about how to use those as probes of different parts of uh, extragalactic space. And so there's been a lot of great thought and like theoretical papers on estimates of how we can do that. And one on the left panel, you can think about, for example, if you had a thousand, so 10 to the three, 10 to the four, so 1,000 to 10,000 fast radio bursts, and they're say detected all over, all throughout space, that's sort of a makes a nice grid on the sky of these little lines of sight to extragalactic space, where we can start to study how, how much dispersion you measure and how that correlates with where the galaxies are and clusters of galaxies. Um, so there's special kind of science you can do with a sample of that many FRBs that are, um, that are localized to host galaxies. In the middle panel, it shows what happens if you have about 10 times more than that. So maybe 10,000 to 100,000 fast radio bursts. Then you can start to probe a very large volume of space and you can start to do correlations with um, uh, look for clustering and, and dispersion measure space. So how many FRBs are actually coming from the same physical volume um, at, at very great distances. Um, and you can also study what's called helium reionization. So at a redshift of about two, so about when the universe was about a third its current age, um, there was a, um, a point in which uh, helium was fully ionized by, um, by uh, radiation from galaxies. And that means that there was suddenly a bit more plasma in the in the, in the intergalactic uh, space. So that extra ionization made more electrons, and that should add a little bit more dispersion to the FRBs at that time. So we can study that with a big, big sample. And then if you go 10 times bigger, you can find the most extremely rare um, sorts of coincidences between um, uh, compact objects and the propagation of, of fast radio burst signals where you can actually see the, the lensing effect as fast radio burst signals are uh, get, come very, very close to compact objects. And that makes a lens in space uh, that, that uh, redirects the light and can be detected. Um, even though the area in the sky covered by these lenses is very, very small, you can actually start to see many of these examples when you have 100,000 FRBs detected. So there's huge scope for using FRBs as probes of the universe. Um, but to get there, we have to really understand uh, what makes them. Because if it turns out that, say, there's more than one kind of FRB source, and maybe some of them are coming from very messy environments, you know, some of them actually have complicated burst structure that doesn't a nice, uh, nice shape, you know, there's all sorts of different confusion factors that might uh, compromise our ability to use them as probes of the intergalactic medium and and strong gravity, then we need to really, if that's the case, then we really need to start categorizing and, and, uh, and understanding the phenomenon of the fast radio burst and their, their sources of uh, the source objects that produce them. So uh, there was a time early on when there are more models for FRBs than there were detected sources. That's because people were so excited. They wrote lots of ideas, uh, papers about how it could be stellar processes, or it could be accreting supermassive black holes, or it could be exploding stars of different kinds, or interaction of binary compact objects, mergers of compact binaries, all sorts of great ideas. Um, and they're largely, um, most of them are still in play. We actually really don't know uh, in detail. Uh, but one of the favorite uh, models for FRBs is uh, a compact, highly magnetized star that we call a magnetarn. So this is a little movie that shows a artist's rendition uh, of the magnetic field around a compact neutron star. And it just schematically shows you, you know, an idea of where the radio waves might come out from, from these uh, sources. 
And this is just, you know, it's just an artist's idea. <laughs> we actually don't know if it comes from the poles. We don't know. There are ideas where you might have the same kind of object, but there actually are, uh, uh, you know, uh, cracking on the surface of the magnetar that produces these big uh, reconfigurations of the magnetic field and a big blast of um, material comes out and hits the magnetic field or it hits the sur surrounding supernova remnant and that produces radio bursts. So there's all sorts of ideas, even with, if you know uh, that it's in magnetar. So um, actually, this is a little bit of what I just said, but so that this is the variety of ways in which the FRB emission is produced. So again, on the left side, we show it shows the, you know, an idea for a compact millisecond spinning magnetar. So very, very fast. Typically, magnetars that we see today in our own galaxy uh, have a period of rotation of about a few seconds. That's because they've evolved to the point where they've sort of slowed down. But we can imagine if we play the clock backwards, when a magnetar is first born, it's actually very expected that it would be spinning much faster. And the combination of that intense magnetic field and fast rotation means it actually will produce what's called a, a, a wind, so a magnetic wind, where it's blasting off or blowing off intense um, plasma emission. And that can actually have instabilities or can have other effects where it impinges upon surrounding material at extremely high energies, that could be relativistic outflows that hit surrounding material, and that in turn can produce um, a variety of high energy emission, or it can produce radio waves that, are, that look a lot like fast radio bursts. Uh, but there are other ideas also. So on the right side is another model, which is, shows a, uh, a binary system. So there's a, there's a neutron star on the left and a sort of typical uh, giant star on the right. And there are actually known systems. You know, this is actually showing a diagram, a schematic of a known binary, uh, pulsar binary system with very well measured properties because we can measure, in many cases, we can see from the, uh, the light curve or doing um, a spectroscopy of the brighter star, you can see the velocity at which it orbits. You can infer things about the masses of the objects in the binary, um, you know, how it's being irradiated by the neutron star um, and other things. So we know a lot about some, some of these kinds of binary uh, stellar systems. And in some cases we can actually know it very well. And then we simultaneously, we can detect uh, the radio pulsations from the pulsar and there are cases where the radio waves are propagating through this sort of shell around the companion star, and they can be uh, amplified and magnified and look a lot like a fast radio burst. Now, these are not typically as luminous, so that such that you would see them at, um, at uh, gigaparsec distances, but they are, in many cases, magnified quite strongly, and theoretical expectations are that they could be magnified at a very even larger level. So that's a good example of something we know exists in the Milky Way, and maybe we can extrapolate to something that exists in other galaxies. So lots of great ideas, <laughs> but um, to really understand which one of these models is the best fit, we need to under have more FRBs that we've um, uh, not only detected, but we've actually localized them very precisely. And so that's the, that's the biggest problem in FRB science right now is finding them with a lot of precision in their spatial location. So for an example, here is the, uh, the famous Hubble deep field. So this is a deep field taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and it was chosen deliberately because it had uh, very few uh, stars, right? It's looking at a part of the sky, which has, um, which is basically out of the galaxy. So there are a couple of stars in there, but not, not much. And that means that we can see everything that's extragalactic. And basically every point in this image, just about every point, is a galaxy. So if you found an FRB and it was somewhere in this circle, as the, as the Parkes Murray Yang telescope uh, can localize them on the sky, you would have uh, no idea which galaxy it was associated with. And even the, the venerable Arecibo telescope, uh, rest in peace, um, has a much larger uh, collecting area and a larger diameter, which gives it a precise, more precise localization on the sky, but it's still not good enough to really pinpoint one source. So what I spent a lot of time doing at the Very Large Array in New Mexico is using a radio interferometer, so not a single large single dish up telescope, but a collection of antennas that are used as an interferometer uh, to sort of synthesize one large telescope with a very high spatial precision. 
So interferometers are really the key, and that's where most of the technical development in the last, say, five years has been, is developing um, uh, new software, new instrumentation that makes it possible to use interferometers to, to identify fast radio bursts. That's been really challenging because, you know, whereas, say, for the Murray-Ng or Siebel, you have basically a lar one large data stream coming in from a single receiving element. In the case of interferometers, you have, you know, the VLA has 27 antennas. Uh, the DSA 110, which I'll talk about, is currently um, partially completed. It has about uh, 63 antennas. And that means you have lots of data streams you have to process and digitally combine to make um, the data streams you need to search for the FRBs. So it's a lot more harder technically and in and, and, and the digital and software development side. Um, but we're getting there. Actually, we're doing uh, we're doing a lot in this area. So my um, major contribution to this field, I think, probably probably, probably this will be my biggest contribution. I, I hope to do bigger things in the future. But it was, it was pretty fun. So that is uh, the first uh, localization of NFRB and association to a host galaxy. And so I was part of a team that helped um, develop this instrumentation I talked about at VLA and run this search, which was pointing in the rough vicinity of, a, of an FRB that we knew uh, would repeat, but was not well localized. So we knew roughly uh, from the Arecibo telescope, we knew roughly what part of the sky was located. And we knew that we could just stare at that location and wait for uh, repetitions of this burst. And all it took was really one burst to detect with the VLA to get that precision and localization we needed to identify a host galaxy. As it turned out, the, this FRB was very, very active. We had nine detected the VLA in an observing campaign of about um, 40 hours or so. And again, there's that distinctive, you know, frequency time chirp signal. And what we did was we extract the signal along this chirp. And then you can do the same thing we do traditional radio interferometers, which is to make an image. So we take tel data from all the different telescopes. We can make that synthetic aperture um, and, and uh, through a computational process, we can make an image of that little slice of data. And that's what's shown in the middle panel here. So this is the full field that the VLA can see. And sure enough, uh, there's this bright flash at this one point in the sky, very precisely localized. And the star pattern is an artifact that's produced by this, um, the fact that we have a, sort of an, um, uh, the fact that we're doing interferometry with this sort of limited number of antennas. Um, so we have 27 in the case of the VLA, and they're spread across a big area, but they're not densely packed like a normal aperture. So it's a partial aperture, and that makes artifacts in the image. But we know we know exactly how it should look. That aperture, that aperture shape is well modeled, and we can so we can localize pre very precisely the the burst itself. The big circles show roughly where we thought it was from Arecibo. So you can see we've done a big improvement from what Arecibo told us. Um, and uh, when you point our telescopes there. Uh, we found uh, this is a uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image, which shows a very faint uh, host galaxy that's very precisely localized with the FRB. So the FRB is the um, the little let's see here. <laughs> I think it's this yes, yeah, this red circle is the FRB, and it sits right on this little knot of star formation. And uh, this ellipse shows the size of the, the host galaxy, which is very small. If you looked at it in the previous image from the Hubble Space Telescope, it probably wouldn't even show up in that image. So we really needed to have that precise VLA localization to get down and have a chance of seeing the host galaxy. And then um, we can turn around and take our um, uh, you know, other optical telescopes, like say the, you know, the, the 200 inch, and put a slit on this galaxy. And we see spectra that look like this. And in fact, the first spectrum of a FRB host galaxy was taken with a 200 inch telescope. And uh, I don't think it's this spectrum. Is it this spectrum? I know we have a few spectra of this galaxy and this might actually be from the, from the 200 inch. Um, but what we're looking for when we put that slit on there is to take that light and then make this spectral uh, measurement where we can identify spectral lines associated with um, star formation or other activity. And when we measure those spectral lines, we instantly know how far away it is. That's the, the measurement of redshift, because we know where those lines should be if the galaxy is at rest. And we typically see the whole set of spectral lines shifted uh, to red, uh, redder wavelengths uh, because they're at great distance and the, um, the Hubble flow 
carries them away from us. And so we can infer uh, a distance from that uh, redshift effect. So first redshift measurement, um, and that instantly tells us that this is not some uh, uh, small pulsar pulse that's in our own galaxy, but it's truly an incredibly luminous, powerful uh, source that's at a, a gigaparsec away. So that's something like um, uh, a million times farther, roughly, than, uh, well, let's see here. Sorry. Yeah, about a million times farther than uh, typical pulsars are from our, in our own galaxy. And because um, uh, a million times squared more luminous than a typical pulsar in our, it would be a, a detected in our own galaxy. So that's a big number. It tells us that's something very, very different from what we've seen before. Uh, one other cool thing that came out of this first localization is it turned out that we also made deep radio images of that field. And see, there's the FRB image. This is a deep radio image. There's a, a persistent radio source at that same location. Now, this is not... This is not just an accumulation of lots of flashes. We can actually um, estimate that. We know that it's a, an, a source that is persistently there at the same position as the radio bursting source. And that turned out to be a real surprise that no one expected. Uh, and it's the motivation for tons of modeling, understanding what's the environment of the FRB source. Uh, and we can measure the spectrum of that source too. The radio spectrum actually is fairly unusual. It has this sort of flat radio spectrum with a kink in it, and it seems to be pretty stable in time. That tells us a bit about how it's powered, tells us how it's evolving in time. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as a cooling break. So there might be some effect where it's been some of the electrons at high frequencies have cooled off, and you have this flat radio spectrum at lower frequencies. So this is an area of continuing um, uh, uh, study, and we don't really understand the nature of the FRB the persistent counterparts, or why they're together. So uh, one fun thing that came out of this, of course, is that it was uh, pretty big news for astronomers, but you know other people were excited too. So the Onion, you know, made a joke about the discovery, and you know, what do you think about this discovery? And I have a bright radio source, and someone says we should we should tell them to knock it off, <laughs> as if it's some sort of alien intelligence, but really it's just, the universe is already fascinating enough for me when we think about incredibly powerful, you know, neutron stars or, or phenomenon like fast radio bursts. So, um, so I mentioned this persistent counterpart, you know, another cool thing about this is that um, it seems to be a different kind of luminous radio source than we've ever seen before. So typically if you do uh, large, uh, deep sensitive radio imaging of the sky, you'll see um, radio emission from galaxies that's associated with either star formation, so lots of you know uh, ionized gas from from uh, that's being ionized by stars that are forming, or perhaps supernovae that are blowing up and uh, and producing lots of non-thermal radiation. Uh, but then you can also have just the nuclei, the supermassive black holes in the nuclei of galaxies, can be accreting matter and producing these big luminous radio jets. So you typically see those two kinds of things in radio galaxies in radio emission from galaxies. But what I'm excited about is this idea that um, there's a third category of thing that we hadn't really appreciated before. So there's a this luminous object that's associated with a fast radio burst is neither of these things, right? It's compact. It's just as luminous as these sorts of things. Um, and they don't sit in the nuclei of galaxies. They're only really associated with fast radio bursts. And so, um, right, so there's a third category of of source that we don't really, doesn't fit in either of these categories. So I think what's fun about it for me is that you can imagine when you look up at the night sky, um, you know, you see all these stars that we know that these stars are uh, to our eye, we're seeing stars that are associated with our own galaxy. When you, but when you look up with the radio eyes, it is actually sort of like a new star in the sky, right? A new kind of star in the sky. And that is these persistent radio counterparts to fast radio bursts, which uh, we didn't even know were a, an actual phenomenon prior to 15 years ago, say. So, um, so I find that pretty exciting that we're sort of changing the way we view the radio sky. Now, the contribution to the number of sources in the sky, we can estimate that it's a small fraction, but it is a new contrib contribution to the radio sky. So I, I, I'm excited about that. By the way, this is a this is a, an image of what's called Sky Rock, which is up in, near Bishop, uh, near Owens Valley uh, Radio Observatory. I encourage you to check it out next time you go. It's a it's a petroglyph by the local people existed for, I think, roughly 
Actually, I don't know how old it is. I think it's, it's but it's pretty quite old. So um, I've been over a lot of the story here, um, and, I, and maybe I'll skip this slide, but um, I can share these later if you like. There's a, but basically, there's been this sort of progression in the last 15 years or so of incredible uh, discoveries. You know, we know that there are some FRBs that repeat. Uh, we know now of a source that looks like an FRB that actually is in our own galaxy. Uh, we know there's an FRB that's been associated with a very unusual stellar environment in a globular cluster of another galaxy. Uh, so there's all sorts of great things that are happening here. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss that in more detail. So let me close by talking about what's coming next. So um, one project that I'm really excited about and spending a lot of time working on at, at, um, at Caltech is uh, the DSA 110 project. So, and it's really uh, the first time someone's built a radio interferometer that was custom built for finding and localizing FRBs. So this is a collection of uh, intended to be 110. Currently, it's composed of 63 um, antennas. In a, in a, there's a core of them that are all aligned together, and then there's a couple that are spread around uh, the overall site. And all together, when they make when you make an image with that whole collection, you have a really sensitive telescope that um, that can localize uh, FRBs quite well. And it also sees a very large area of sky. So the larger the area of sky, the faster we can detect. The, uh, the more frequently we can detect FRBs. So we find them often and we localize them. And here's a quick sample of three that we found early on in the project, which really started observing, um, um, I guess it's just a little over a year ago now, we first turned it on in earnest. And at uh, the top, you see those, dis those radio impulses. So in this case, the dispersion delay is corrected for us. So they're just vertical lines. And then the, the chirp uh, is sort of taken out but you can see, at least you can see a little bit of differences in between different bursts. So one burst kind of looks like a simple little, little flash. One has two little flashes, and then one on the right has a flash that's a little bit wider, and it has sort of spectral structure. You can see scintillation effects there. All of those things are physically you know, interesting, and we can measure and characterize them uh, across all FRBs detected. Then the bottom row shows images uh, actually taken with the PanSTARRS telescope, which is a nice all-sky uh, imaging telescope. And you can see in each case, the radio burst is localized to a little white circle and it sits on a galaxy. So uh, in each case, they're slightly different from each other. The one on the right, it turns out is very interesting. It's a galaxy that's very, very close to us. And that means that we're seeing um, an FRB that's not, not too far away and we can study it in better detail than, it, than many other FRBs. So um, now we're the DSA 110 project is actually going since that time, the first three, you know, I guess I should say over the last year, uh, we've continued to observe and have now found 30, uh, a little over 30 FRBs actually from this array, roughly one per week, one per one and a half weeks, maybe all told. And this is a nice little uh, optical uh, sort of postage stamp image for every FRB in that detection uh, in that sample that's been detected. Um, so you can see a lot of diversity in, in how the, the optical images, the host galaxies look for, for, those, uh, for those first 30 FRBs. And that's what we're really excited about doing with the DSA. This is a sample that is uh, more than doubling uh, what's, at, what's been detected before in terms of the host galaxies. Uh, people have worked really hard to find the, 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 uh, the other host galaxies uh, but now we're finding them at scale. Uh, one fun thing you can take away from this little um, postage stamp collection here is that they're actually sorted in order of um, expected distance. So we have a way of estimating distance from the dispersion measure. And so the smallest dispersion measure is in the top left, and you can go across the right and then down a row and down a row. And then the bottom row is the ones that we expect to be most distant. And if you notice a pattern, the ones on the top tend to be sitting in galaxies that are look very large. That's because, in fact, they are quite close to us. And the ones at the bottom often don't have galaxies at all. And that's because the PanSTARRS telescope is not sensitive enough to see those host galaxies. So that presents a bit of a challenge. You know, if we want to study these host galaxies and understand the what kinds of galaxies can host FRBs and solve this FRB origin problem, we need to have bigger telescopes. And then the Hale telescope is a, is a great one. Uh, for going after these five meter uh, diameter. And then the Keck telescope is also a big part of our uh, team's efforts uh, because it's 
even bigger. Um, uh, but um, again, uh, there's just so much work to do here uh, that that these that this class of telescope, five meters and bigger, are going to be doing a lot of work for FRB host galaxy uh, studies in the near future. Um, and I have uh, oops backwards. Uh, and then the next generation, so uh, beyond the DSA-110, we're now talking about a really exciting and more ambitious uh, project called DSA-2000. And this would be an entirely new radio interferometer that would be, uh, we're, we're currently uh, actively developing very aggressively uh, while simultaneously observing with the DSA-110. So we got a lot going on. Um, and um, uh, the idea is to have a new antenna design, new receiver design, new digital system that can do more things, not just FRBs, but also uh, make exquisite images. And that the part of the image, the reason that we can make really, really terrific images with the DSA 2000 is then that number 2000. To, in the past, you know, the VLA was a very large um, digital process, signal processing problem in its time. It has 27 antennas, and we're going, you know, almost 100 times larger than that. Um, you can imagine that the computing problem associated with the DSA 2000 is, is very, very large, uh, much larger than before. So we have a number of um, novelties, not only in, and, um, to, you know, in, in terms of the antenna design to make them uh, affordable at, when you build 2000, but also in terms of the digital signal processing and, and software and algorithms for processing that data. So, um, uh, this is a simulated image, actually, of the sky for, I think it includes an area of uh, similar to the, what the DSA uh, 110 field shows. So it's a few square degrees on the sky. And you can see it's just packed with sources, right? And um, this is meant to be a physically re realistic um, estimate of the distribution of brightnesses and sizes for radio sources on the sky. So there's all kinds of things we can measure here. And the science scope for, for this sort of imaging telescope with deep images is in itself an incredible um, opportunity. Um, but we're also gonna do commensal, commensally. So in parallel with these imaging surveys, we'll do the FRB searches as well. So I'm gonna um, close here. Um, and um, I'll say um, that FRBs are an, an incredibly uh, mysterious and powerful new phenomenon that, we've, uh, that we're starting to understand, but we, we really, um, really not quite there yet. I think there's a big things we expected from DSA 110 efforts in that regard in the near future. Um, and beyond that, they're actually very valuable even when we, we've, without understanding that origin problem in detail, we know that they're gonna be useful as probes of the universe, whether it be through studying distant plasma, intergalactic medium or in other galaxies, but also potentially through studying strong gravity effects with lensing of FRBs. Uh, and the, one of the most exciting things about the field is that it continues to surprise us, whether it be, you know, identifying a fast radio burst uh, with these luminous radio counterparts that are persistent or FRBs that are um, in our own galaxy, uh, one FRB source that's in our own galaxy. They continue to be surprised every year. And so uh, I'm just always having fun with those surprises. And one other point I would just like to make is that things like DSA 2000 are really um, demonstrating that the radio sky looks very different than what you expect. And we're hoping to demonstrate that with, um, with newer and bigger projects in the future. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Casey Law, thank you very much. Fast, fascinating subject, fascinating developments. And with that, I'd like to throw things open for questions. Um, Actually, if I, if I could, just before I um, take questions, I, I'm happy to take questions, but I wanted to just also share one link that I that came up recently. So as it turns out, um, Science Magazine wrote a nice little article about the, the DSA 110 and 2000 projects. So people can read that out there at their leisure. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. But yes, uh, uh, questions are welcome. Please, you can turn on your microphones and join the discussion and please come up with a question. Mm -hmm. Or shall I, I could also go through the chat if you like. Uh, we can do that too, yes. Um, yeah, since, well, let me just try that first since people were doing that during the talk. So um, 
I see uh, fast reader bursts to will data be provided to gravitational wave database. Right. Um, yeah, 04 of LIGO. Um, that's right. So there actually uh, is a lot of potential overlap between gravitational wave surveys with LIGO and fast radio bursts. So uh, LIGO um, sends out alerts and makes a lot of their data public. I think projects like DSA 2000, when they're at that big scale, we and, and also DSA 110, they also want to make their data public right away so that people can do clever things about, you know, um, you know, data science sort of things where you can try to align them or you can find, um, you know, infer things about the nature of those sources um, from the uh, joint data set. Um, uh, but then there's also the instantaneous, you know, co-observing and things like that we can do. Um, and that is um, uh, on the DSA 2000 side, I know there's a lot of interest in doing follow-up of LIGO events to look for the afterglow of these neutron star mergers. So they have a big uh, slow transient that comes from the merger of two neutron stars. And you see the gravitational waves with LIGO, and then we can look that later with, um, with, with sensitive radio interferometers and see this afterglow phenomenon. So that's a big, a big um, topic in, in transients also. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Can I pick up on that one quickly? Um, are there any optical remnants known from fast radio bursts? So currently we have, um, there, there was a paper recently actually on um, the potential coincidence of a gamma ray burst with a fast radio burst, but it's still a little speculative. And the, as, as far as I understand and remember, uh, there are no um, uh, uh, simultaneous detections of any other, um, in other, any other wavelength band. So if we find radio, fast radio bursts, there's no optical uh, ultraviolet X-ray gamma ray detected uh, prompt burst that coincides with it. That does not exist yet. But there is um, there's one paper out recently which claims, um, I think it claims yeah it claims that there might be one of these examples a gamma ray burst that's coincident. So that's still quite new. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so I see a question also about Starlink. Yeah, Starlink is a big concern in radio astronomy. Um, we all like to have good internet service, um, but. <laughs> For, for radio astronomers, it's a big problem there. And there are, it's not just Starlink, there's, um, you know, it's just a huge commercial uh, field now. Um, uh, and some, some, some of these companies are actually a little more responsible than others. Starlink, I think, will take requests to, um, to avoid radio observatories. So we actually have a request in for them to avoid um, beaming down on our, for example, the DSA 2000 site, if we ever build it, that's out in Nevada. Um, but that's um, not always the case for other providers. And so uh, it's a big concern for us is this communications in, uh, interference. Um, and pa so Paolo had a question. Paolo, do you want to turn on your microphone and join the discussion or? Paolo? Okay. Let's bring it in from the uh, chat beyond the field size comparison between a single dish and a radio interferometer. I would like to know if the process of correlation detection is a challenge in radio interferometry. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. Um... Right. So the yes, yeah, so the question is about um, you know how do we do? I guess the question is sort of about how do we do the signal processing and the correlation, and and the uh, detection and, and the search for these brief radio flashes. It is a big challenge actually, um, but one of the nice things is that um, uh, you know there's this famous uh, Moore's law, right? Uh, we know our computers are getting more powerful all the time. And so to some degree that saves us and when we're trying to do new and more ambitious things with digital signal processing. Um, uh, but also we're getting smarter about using processors. So a big uh, development right now for, um, for radio astronomy is to use these GPUs, so graphical processing units. And there are many um, 
uh, very uh, you know um, new algorithms that that use very deep knowledge of how GPUs are designed. New GPU designs also can make you know new things possible because they can change the the way the computing or the way the memory works in the GPUs. And that's a big part of the DSA 2000 concept is to use GPUs uh, very, very uh, efficiently. It's basically a Mr. Casey. Yes. Mr. Casey, I would like to add a, a, another question. Uh, I have a, a, an observatory here in Brazil and in the South Hemisphere. And I've worked at, um, uh, with some other counterparties in discovering optical counterparts in uh, millisecond uh, ulcers, this kind of thing. Uh, do you believe that makes sense to follow up uh, your broker or whatever, trying to capture in real time or almost in real time, so two minutes after the person is detected, to try to capture some optical image in near infrared or uh, optical? Do you believe that this makes sense or in this case, something that is uh, out of question no it's a really great question in fact there are people trying to do that very actively so it's a great it's a great concept you know so most for the most part there that the goal is to find this sort of prompt flash right so there's a prompt there's a radio flash and they want to find the same flash at optical telescopes that's one strategy and the idea is that it's the same you know the same emission process that you see a, a different wavelength um, and when you want to do it that way, the best strategy is just to observe the same field at the same time. You know, that's because that's so fast, right? It's difficult to do it differently. Um, and um, um, that's a little challenging because radio telescopes can have very wide, very large fields of view in order, and you have to observe for like over a 10 square degree field for a week to find one FRB, right? So it's actually quite challenging. You can't really do that you can't observe for continuously with an optical telescope and you can't observe 10 square degrees very easily. So that's that's part of the challenge of the optical pro project project. So you can't what you can do is you can target known FRBs um, with the optical and radio telescopes and you can observe a, you know one source. And people have done that experiment and they they have not yet found optical counterparts, but I think the theoretical expectation is that we can get there with um, something like you know the there's an instrument on, on the Hale telescope called Chimera, which is well suited to this. It's a fast readout mm -hmm. telescope, um, and that, that could be appropriate for that. But you need you need to have you need to know where to look with the optical telescope, and you need to have very uh, very large telescopes. Okay, I, do you have a broker or something like that where we can capture on a virtual observatory the data that you are getting, or uh, how uh, it's I'm, possible? Yeah, to... it's an area that I'm excited about, um, and I like I like sharing our data you know i like making it public and making it and helping people you know uh, to have access to it and see it um uh i think um let's see i think on the time scales of relevance you know we're we're not trying to build that right now um what we're trying to do is spend a lot of time sending um uh, as fast as possible in, you know signals from the dsa for example to low frequency radio telescopes and the reason that's helpful is that the, the low frequency telescope gets a little extra time to catch the burst, right? Because the dispersion delay is very, it actually can add about a minute delay at the very lowest frequencies. And so if you find it at the DSA, you can tell your low frequency telescope to, you know, it can take a few seconds to think about it and then it can go chase it down and observe at that location. So that's a that's an area that I'm actually pretty excited about. But again, that's a fairly, um, uh, we don't know that those bursts exist at those different low frequencies, and so um, that's so, sort of a, um, it's not, uh, it's not um, <clears throat> guaranteed success, yeah. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I guess we, we're not thinking really hard about instant public alerts, um, but I think we want to get there uh, soon. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Ken, okay. Ken, you had a question. Yes, and let me see if I can phrase it better than I could in the chat. Uh, you indicated that you measure the polarization of the of the FRB signals as they come in. Uh, what kind of phenomena or structures in the intergalactic medium or other places produce that? It sounds like a reflection. And do you have enough? Uh, how stable are those are those conditions? And do you have enough? Uh, probe-like signals that you begin to map and get some kind of a, 
an understanding of the extent of them and be able to apply that to future signals. Right. And so you um so are you thinking specifically about polarization? Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, was, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Um so I had this one where I showed I showed a little DSA data. This is um showing the unpolarized light in this radio mm -hmm. plot here. But we actually do measure the full polarization. Um so these what we call Stokes parameters. And um, we measure it as a function of frequency and time. So there is a lot of science you can do with, you know, um, sort of characterizing that from the signals we measure. Uh, the expectation is kind of similar. It's a similar kind of idea to what the dispersion effect does, right? We're assuming that it has, we can, we can safely assume that it has sort of a, uh, a simple signal initially, and that we're seeing it move through this medium and be modified as it propagates. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is generally that it's um, has a strong linear polarization initially. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. so a strong linear polarization, and then as it propagates through material, it induces what's called rotation measure, um, among other things. And rotation measure is um, is uh, essentially a um, a change in the polarization angle as a function of frequency. And so, if you see that rotation as it, cha it changes across the band, it tells you about how strongly magnetized the material is between you and oh. the FRB. Mm -hmm. And so that's really fun. And actually, there's a grad student, uh, Miles Sherman, who's writing up a paper on the first polarimetry with DSA-110 right, right now. Um, and then one of the things he's trying to trying to infer is, you know, where is that strongly magnetized stuff? You know, is are mm -hmm. the FRBs we find in material that is magnetized like pulsars in our own galaxy or is it a different kind of material you know or strength of the magnetic field so that's something that helps us get to that origin problem also thank you yeah. in this slide i have a question about the slide in the middle upper picture there are two peaks is does that mean that it's coming from two frb engines or is it one frb engine that somehow is different from the other two yeah, it's a good question. So we see um <laughs> it's we we see a wide variety of sort of um um patterns in the in the what we call like the light curve. So you can see a one simple flash, you can see a couple of flashes. Generally, you know, the we consider these like one burst where it's maybe a complicated burst. But you know, sometimes those bursts will be separated by, you know. A minute <laughs> does that mean it's a repeating burst or does that mean it's one burst that was like really spread out or something like that you know we don't really know but the, a, one simple um uh you can estimate the um um you can get an idea to how to estimate the size of the emission from the width in time and there's a way to do that basically from knowing that light can only propagate so fast you know and so there's sort of a relativity limit on how uh, how fast something can flash. And that gives us an idea that if it's this close together, like a millisecond, it's probably on, it's probably something that's smaller than a neutron star surface. So that's one way we can talk about, you know, things on this time scale are probably still happening on the same neutron star, if it's a neutron star. <laughs> um, but yeah, if it's something that repeats the, on the same part of the sky and it repeats a week later, um, is that a coincidence then you know and is that not a coincidence then there has other questions that come into it generally the dispersion measure helps us a lot in that regard if it's the same dispersion measure at the same place in the sky it's probably the same source okay um, any other questions what does one antenna cost to build at over do you want to add one antenna Oh yeah. Um, so let's see, I uh, let's see here. So oh, what was the cost? So the DSA one ten project. I should have showed a picture of the, the antennas. They are um, they're a lot simpler than the DSA two thousand ones, but they're about the same size. Um, so the one ten antennas are commercial, and I believe they cost something like the like just the physical structure of it was something like a thousand dollars. Maybe it was two thousand, something like that. And then there's the uh, a, a, you know fairly significant addition to that is just the the um, the receiver element. So like well, how we sense the radio waves. Is, there's a lot of work that goes into that engineering work to make sure that it's very very sensitive, even though it's not a cooled receiver. 
And so that's a very big engineering challenge that that we've basically solved. Um, and um, I, that that component is maybe a few hundred dollars. Um, and then I think um, I, 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 these numbers I might be wrong on it by a factor of two actually, <laughs> but um, I do believe that these antennas are going to be built um, as you know, somewhat higher cost because they need to be quite precise, and it's being built custom. Uh, by our own team, I'm currently engineering that, and these the goal is to have these be about ten thousand dollars each, and they do a lot more. So they're you know um, they they're fully steerable. They're much more precise. Um, they have this shield on them to protect from interference on the uh, coming in from the sides, so that's why they cost a bit more. But they have to be really cheap to make two thousand of them. Obviously, are there naming opportunities here? Yeah. I know that uh, you know <laughs> graduates of, of elite engineering universities like to have things named after them <laughs> uh, yeah i'm i uh, i can certainly put anyone who's interested in charge with uh, interested in, in touch with the uh the uh the, the, the development office i believe is what it's called uh, <laughs> i am i'm not a faculty member so like i'm not so connected to the funding side of it but uh, certainly we're, you know there's great uh, so we have great private support for the for this 2000 project in particular the sa 110 is is funded by the national science foundation uh, which is a public entity, and that was through a competitive public process. Um, uh, but the DSA 2000 is a little more, um, it's, it's more, much more ambitious, and it's a little more speculative because we're doing a lot of low-level engineering work. And so because of that, it's been really, really helpful to have private funding. And so there's a group called the Schmidt Futures um, uh, Philanthropy, which is uh, created by Eric Schmidt, the former Google CEO. And their mission is very much about um, Sort of supporting disruptive, uh, high-risk technologies, and that's um, something that we're, I think, we're doing well, or becoming lower and lower risk all the time because we know how to build the antennas pretty well, and we know how to do the digital signal processing pretty well. Other other questions? Anybody? Please step up. Well, we are we are getting down on time. Uh, Dr. Casey Law, thank you very much. Um, wonderful discussion. I guess you've been very, very generous with your time today. Let me, if I might, conclude with one question. Um, you know, you you are you are writing data analysis software, data analysis routines, as you imagine it, as you as you think of the future. What's the next big step? What's the next big advance that you could imagine in signal processing? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, um, I, I, you know, I'm staring at this slide of the DSA 2000. I feel like we have some big challenges here already. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I didn't really talk a lot about the data volume and data rate problems with the DSA 2000, but that is a huge huge problem, and, I mean, challenge. Um, and actually, we're, I think we're doing a really good job on developing prototypes and sort of breaking out smaller problems that we can solve well. But there's one really cool idea that, that is in my slide. It's called a radio camera. And that's this idea that we can take as, you know, as I, well, let me just share this one more time. Um, but, you know, I showed you earlier, where is it now? Um, yeah, so on this slide, I showed you this image from the VLA, right, where it has this, this star pattern in it. And this star pattern comes from the fact that it's 27 antennas, which you're trying to take those and combine them in, in a way that um, we call synthesizes an image, right? We're trying to make it look like it's a single telescope image from a, you know, uh, with, with a size of about 20 kilometers or something, right? So we're pretending you know, through digital signal processing and algorithms that it's a large, large aperture, but they were only sampling little pieces of it. So it's sort of like we're working with a broken mirror in a sense. And that, that introduces artifacts in the images like this. And the goal of DSA 2000 is to take, not only have, um, uh, is just to fully fill that aperture. So we have a same area of about uh, 15, 18 kilometers area and pack it with antennas, right? 2,000 of them in there. And, um, 
And that allows us to basically make images that look pristine right off the back of the correlation step. So we can make these images and none of those artifacts will exist. They'll be massively suppressed. But to do that properly means that we have to have both, um, both the, um, the sort of the collection of the data integrated with that image formation step. And that integration is what we're calling the radio camera. Um, so, so that, and that's sort of shown schematically on the right here. So um, you have this middle plane on the right, which shows all these sorts of um, antenna measurements we make on this sort of uh, virtual plane of the sky called the UV plane. And then if we can sample that very densely and integrate all of the digital signal processing with the image formation, we can effectively make a camera for the radio sky. And it doesn't have any of these artifacts in it that the VLA would have, for example, or the DSA-110. So that's to me the biggest digital signal processing challenge for the next generation is making radio telescopes into true cameras as we think of optical telescopes, like say the, the 200 inch. Tremendous. Tremendous idea. And again, thank you very much. Um, and with that, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. How about a big round of applause for Stephen Flanders for putting this together for so long. We really, really appreciate your organization and follow through and everything else. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Hey, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll come back to it. In November, it's been great fun to do this. Um, I've really, I've really enjoyed it over the last three years, and I want to thank everybody for coming and supporting, and being here and participating. So thank you very much. And with that, Dr. Casey Law, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'll close the meeting, and we'll see you in November. Bye bye. Right. Take care.